Thank you very much. It's much appreciated and uh, it is my absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, good evening from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. So it's about 9 p.m. here on the 27th. I'm about 12 and a half hours behind you. Um, I'm actually at Shawnigan Lake on vacation and about, about half an hour from, uh, from Victoria. Uh, again, thank you to the organizers of the uh, 2022 IASR International Conference on Forensic Science uh, for the invitation to speak here. Uh, I trust you can hear me okay. I'm on my, uh, my notebook computer. Yeah, perfect. Uh, is it okay? Yes, sir. Perfectly fine. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. Well, uh, here in Victoria, I'm the sergeant in charge of the forensics unit at the Saanich Police Department. And uh, Saanich is a municipality within Greater Victoria. Uh, in Canada, we are considered uh, a medium sized department, just over, just under 200 sworn members. And our area includes urban, rural, and even marine environments, uh, predominantly would be lakes and some coastline. I started policing in uh, 2002 and was a high school teacher for uh, seven years prior to my career change. Uh, I've been in forensic investigator for about 15 years. And I received all of my forensics, CSI, and collision investigation training after I became a police officer. My university degree is in education. So specifically, in rough numbers, I had a look at my, uh, uh, looked up on our prime system. I've worked approximately 3,500 crime scenes. And I've taken around 160,000 photographs. Uh, break and enters, homicides, arsons, assaults, any crime you could think of, uh, we've covered it over the years. I've worked indoor scenes, outdoor scenes, underwater scenes, and uh, even a plane crash. Back in 2005, when I first, uh, it was the first time I heard my colleagues debating uh, the old question, is forensics true science? Is forensics really an art? Still to this day, these similar questions come up. Well, I'd like to suggest to you today that um, forensics is both a science and an art, and necessarily so. So the premise of this discussion is simply stated, is science taking over the art of crime scene investigation? I regularly have conversations about this topic and similarly themed topics with my themed topics with my team at work and often with the detectives who come down to our office uh, to talk about files. My team and I will typically discuss crime scene exam techniques, strategies, hammer out protocols for different files, talk about having a wide perspective, being open to possibilities. With the detectives, it's often around two ideas or suggestions. Just test everything and send it all to the lab. The tag of science is not needed to give forensics and crime scene investigation credibility. Is it possible that in an effort to earn the label science, we are forgetting that the CSI is in fact an artist who uses scientific developments and tools to assist with locating evidence. CSI is definitely not science alone. Now granted full-time forensic lab work, very much scientifically driven. In fact, one could say that full-time forensic lab work is very much more science than perhaps art. I can certainly accept that. What's the ultimate goal of a forensic crime scene investigation? Well, one way to look at it is you're using physical evidence to make logical conclusions as to what likely happened, when, how, and potentially whom. One of the more common questions I get from forensic investigators at a scene is this, how did you figure that out? Well, 
let's talk about an example. About three weeks ago, literally maybe four weeks ago, I attended a death scene. Now, the deceased male was about a month into decomp and was located in the bathtub of a small one room cottage. The science of CSI would simply say that the deceased appeared to have succumbed to a lethal hydrogen sulfide va vapor created by mixing hydrochloric acid and lime sulfur. The art of CSI using the physical evidence located at the scene and based upon accumulated knowledge, training and experience would say that the deceased male lived alone in a hoarder type surrounding. He was a recluse, he rarely went out. He likely had had his last interaction with the world on or close to July 11th, 2022, because we found receipts. He had used industrial toilet cleaner as a source for hydrochloric acid and lime sulfur pesticide as a source of sulfur-based chemical. Three empty one liter containers of each were located on the bathroom floor. The deceased had used duct tape and plastic to seal his windows from the inside. He had deliberately barricaded the door also from the inside, thus confirming he had acted alone. The deceased had enclosed himself in his bathtub using more plastic sheeting and duct tape and he had used two plastic containers which were located in his lap in the tub in order to be able to mix the hydrochloric acid and the lime sulfur only when he was ready. In order to ensure that he would be able to complete this chemical mixing procedure, the deceased had also donned eye protection in the form of clear plastic goggles and he was still wearing these goggles in his decomposed state. Finally, a suicide note was located proximal to this deceased computer in the main room. The science of CSI certainly assisted with the investigation. Chemical A plus chemical B created vapor C. The art of CSI told the story. The answer to the question above earlier, how did you figure that out? is a simple one. And I would just simply reply, let me show you. Let's talk a little bit about DNA analysis, an incredible tool in the world of solving crime. From the first registered conviction of a murderer using DNA evidence in 1988, that being the Pitchfork case in Leicester, England, who was convicted in 1983 and 1986 for the murder of two young women, to today where cold cases are being solved on a regular basis using DNA evidence. DNA could now be considered the hammer when it comes to the identifying of suspects. Even in my own relatively short time and in the field, about 15 years, advancements in DNA analysis have been significant and they've been notable. The development of DNA analysis has now reached a point where a viable comparable profile can be generated using such infinitesimal amounts of biological material that confusion and red herrings can result. Is the profile generated from the analysis of a murder weapon a potential suspect or is it perhaps from the store clerk who stocked the shelf where it was bought two days earlier, or perhaps from a customer who handled the item and however didn't purchase it. Another thought, locally, an investigation, an arson investigation in 2021, it was an apartment block. This investigation was cl clouded by the DNA analysis results received from the submission of a hat, which was located at the scene and in fact attributed to the individual who may have been responsible for setting the fire. A major profile, two minor profiles, and two mixed genetic profiles were generated. This is a great example of how the CSI needs to be cognizant of the complex results 
which can come from the analysis of an exhibit. The art of CSI considers whether or not submitting that hat for DNA analysis was necessary or prudent in the first place. In this case, it was. The art of CSI can sort out which profiles are more relevant than others and how to interpret these results relative to all of the physical evidence gathered at the scene. Here's another example. We've all had to make decisions regarding submission of exhibits for DNA analysis. Let's look at footwear. To submit it or not submit it. Now, if blood or other bodily fluid is located on the shoe, then the answer is likely a resounding yes, submit. However, simply submitting a shoe with the hope of generating a DNA profile could be problematic. With the development of DNA analysis, the likelihood of a profile being generated is definitely strong. In fact, depending on the circumstances, the likelihood of there being more than one DNA profile or a collection of mixed profiles generated is also strong. Are all of these individuals gonna be involved? If more than one profile is generated, due to the scientific capabilities of the analysis, would they all be considered suspects? Could the case being built against the primary suspect be compromised by the locating of numerous minor or mixed profiles? Certainly defense lawyers love a good red herring, and I know a number in Victoria who would love to hear this kind of a result. Okay, now more than ever, the art of CSI needs to be emphasized when it comes to the decisions related to the submission of exhibits for DNA analysis and the results received from that analysis. Is there an amount of DNA or genetic material that is too small to be useful for crime scene work? When we're talking picograms, I think there is, a picogram being one trillionth of a gram. Submitting an exhibit just because you can is not the answer. Be careful what you wish for. Talk a little bit about the speed of the results. Now, to, not to be confused with concerns which do arise with the increasingly small amounts of genetic material required to generate a DNA profile is the increase in speed in which a DNA profile can be generated. Now, rapid DNA testing has been a very welcome and ever-developing technology, which can provide accurate DNA results in under, under two hours now. Now, will the development of this science and technology continue? Yes, and thankfully so. Will there be a time in the not too distant future where CSIs will carry with them handheld rapid DNA or analyzers? I say yes, and in fact, the technology is there now. It's just a matter of time, and we will all be carrying them. Two statements to consider. Can the amount of genetic material needed to generate a DNA profile be too small for useful crime scene work? I suggest yes. Can the speed that a DNA profile be generated ever be too fast for useful crime scene work? In this case, I suggest no. Let's talk a little bit about fingerprints. Are we at a point on the science side of the house that one could simply swab a fingerprint, submit the swab for DNA analysis, and have a donor be identified? Would that work? In some cases, yes, absolutely. But what if that impression was left on a surface in victim blood, which was on the murderer's hands? What would you get if you swabbed that print? Clearly the DNA profile of the victim. However, without the CSI or fingerprint examiner, 
using the skills that they have to identify that impression, the suspect may get away. This very situation occurred in my jurisdiction in Saanich about two years ago. We had a homicide with a knife. A suspect print was found in victim's blood on the blade of the murder weapon. It was a large kitchen knife with a large blade. The fingerprint identification placed the weapon in the suspect's hand. In fact, it is possible that due to the overwhelming presence of victim blood on the weapon, a DNA analysis may not have generated a usable suspect profile. So we didn't end up submitting that knife at all. There was no need to, for us to do that. We had a confidence in what we had achieved in the first instance. Are there situations where swabbing a fingerprint may be the best option? Certainly, especially in the case where the quality and quantity of friction ridge detail is such that an, identif that an identification would not be possible. However, solving crimes cannot be left to just science. We'll talk about one more class of, of tool that we use as CSIs, presumptive tests. Presumptive tests are used to guide a CSI and give an indication as to whether or not a substance being sought is present. For instance, Blood. Science has led to the development of numerous presumptive tests for blood, such as luminol and many others. However, science cannot decide what or where to test. Could you test every surface, item, or exhibit? Certainly, individual exhibits can be tested and very thoroughly and completely. And perhaps even a small area, a sort of room, a bathroom, a small area could be completely tested. However, it is the art of CSI that will guide an investigator to the areas and items which make the most sense relative to the incident. Consideration must also be given as to whether or not a presumptive test will have a negative effect on future forensic analysis of that same item. Decisions need to be made and examination plans need to be formulated. Science plays a part. However, the art of CSI, in my mind, plays a larger one. The art of CSI is a perishable skill one which must be practiced, refined, and used. Science has played and will continue to play a key role in forensics and crime scene investigation. However, the two must work hand in hand. A cookie cutter approach to crime scene investigation will just not work. Knowledge, training, and experience are the three crucial factors that a CSI brings to every crime scene and every exhibit and examination. Sprinkle some science on all three and you will solve crime. Remove the science and you will still solve crime. Remove the art of the CSI and I suggest that you will solve significantly less. When the homicide team comes down and asks us, can't you just swab that and give us a name? The answer from us is and needs to be, well, it's not that simple. I'm in no way anti-science. Even in my time as a CSI, I have seen and benefited from advancements in science and technology and would never want to go back However, during that same time as a CSI, without a doubt, I have seen firsthand how vital a role the art of CSI plays in solving crime. 
is science taking over the art of crime scene investigation? My answer is only if we let it. And please, I do not think we should and we shouldn't let it. Thank you again for, your opportunity, for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, the opportunity and it's a privilege to uh, talk with you and I look forward to uh, uh, future opportunities. Uh, thank you again very much.